So this is my cash base story of how I started my cash base practice, how I left standard care, opened up my cash base practice, and how I'm looking at scaling nowadays. So this is my cash base story and pretty much what I learned along the way. Uh, my objectives, you know, to go over my story and how I got started, to kind of go over basic concepts and lessons that I learned along the way, and the future of healthcare and the future of physical therapy. And, you know, I believe that cash is going to have a huge role in this going into the future. And for all you young PTs out there watching this, um, I'm going to give you a tip on creating wealth. And if you want to be a millionaire, you want to stay until the end of this. I'm going to show you how to do it. So if you follow any of my stuff, I like to operate by the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Okay, there's no need to make things complex. I like to keep principles simple. And so you can apply them and kind of understand them. So um, my story and how I got started, but I'm going to add a little Star Wars twist to this. So I hope you like Star Wars. Um, if you do, you're going to love this. If not, uh, you're probably going to be like, this guy is the biggest dork. But anyway, wanted to add a little bit of fun. So there's a little bit of Star Wars twist in all this. So in the beginning, the academic menace and being a new PT graduate in the Clone Wars and what I had to, and what we had to like go through as a new grad. So this is actually a picture of me when I had hair. I was doing a clinical rotation. I was doing acute care clinical rotation in Charlotte, North North Carolina in Presbyterian Hospital. And the PT scrubs were bright purple like this. So um, I did my undergrad at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I majored in um, sports medicine with a minor in chemistry. At the time, I was deciding on whether I want to go into med school, PT school, or do a master's in a PhD in exercise science or something like that. Ended up going into PT school. I applied to all the D1 programs from UNC Chapel Hill all the way down to Miami. Ended up getting in at the University of South South Carolina. Um, that was the only school that I got actually accepted into. And the only reason why I got into that school is because a professor from my undergrad, which is a small school in Western Pennsylvania, knew the dean in the University of South of South Carolina. And she said that I was the top 1% to ever come out of IUP. And she knew that guy through the American College of Sports, Sports Medicine. And that's the only reason why I even got in there. Every other school said no. So, and I, and I even had to take my GREs three times to even get in because I wasn't breaking a thousand. So anyway, um, so I started PT school at the University of South, South Carolina. Um, <clears throat> and at this point you're in, and my goal was not to be the best student anymore. My goal was to be the best PT. So I actually started taking con ed courses in uh, physical therapy school. Um, and then I ended up graduating. I was contemplating on whether I wanted to do a residency or not. So then I worked in an outpatient orthopedic clinic in Savannah, Georgia. My best friend and I actually moved to Savannah um, and we worked there in an outpatient orthopedic practice there. So um, what I learned along the way, uh, you know, you're taught a lot about evidence-based practice and everyone here, you know, were fed uh, evidence-based practice throughout PT school with the combination of the best evidence plus clinical experience plus patient values. So that's a foundational principle of, of what Medicine 2.0 is doing now. Um, and then, you know, we all know what standard physical therapy is, where you come out of grad school and you're like, this is horrible. Yeah. And it's really that bad. You know, there's declining reimbursement, you're forced to see two to three patients an hour. It's not based on outcomes. Everyone gets the same number of treatments. You know, you're, you're pretty much overworked and underpaid. And then you're, the health insurance is the big thing that limits standard care and limits the care for, for the patients. Um, one thing that I did learn is it's really awesome to find a mentor as a new grad. It really helps guide you down uh, the right way. And these are a list of some of my mentors. Um, uh, but finding a mentor right out of school or even throughout school is a great thing. They'll guide you on what's, on what's right and wrong. And these are some of my mentors that kind of helped guide me throughout my journey as a new grad and as a PT student. And at the time, you know, so we're all going to need a little Yoda to help guide us throughout um, our process of learning the force and becoming a Jedi Knight. So one thing that 
one of my mentors, James Dunning, said when I first started out, and it stuck with me so much that um, no matter, and I was taking like, this is when I was in PT school and we were taking con ed courses, I think. And he said this, he's like, don't you owe it to the patient to do what is best for them? And that just stuck with me ever since. So that's what I built my whole foundation on is doing what is best for uh, the patient at all times. And one thing, like another thing that I learned when choosing a job is you really want to find a company that has the same values and principles as you do. You want to make sure that you align with, with the company purpose and you want to believe in the vision of the company. It's really important that those things match. And when you're choosing a job or choosing to work for someone, um, because my first job, we didn't really see eye to eye. It wasn't going, <laughs> it wasn't going the uh, right way. But definitely when you're looking to work for a company and work with someone, make sure your values and principles line up good. So then we're in standard healthcare and it's the revenge of the Sith, which this is me and I'm fighting against the dark side of the force as standard healthcare and I'm a Jedi Knight in the raging inferno of standard healthcare. <laughs> so I end up going to do a one year orthopedic residency at Florida Hospital, now Advent Healthcare. Um, I took a pay cut. I wanted to get good quick. So I really, um, I surrounded myself with kind of mentors. I did the orthopedic residency. The residency, you can get certified and get your OCS fast. So I just wanted to get good quick. So I went back, I did a residency in Florida. But then after I completed a residency, which I would have two publications, I have my OCS, I have all this stuff. So um, they actually told me that I wasn't going to get a raise. I wasn't going to get this. I wasn't going to get that. So I actually quit Florida Hospital at, at the time. Um, and I was, uh, I quit Florida Hospital and I just started working PRN doing outpatient sports med in a spine facility. And uh, I actually saw the director of rehab at the CSM conference and we talked and stuff and they wanted me to come back as a PRN or just, or just like a part-time PT. So they put me in a spine facility. I really liked working with spine. And um, so I was working in outpatient ortho in standard care, seeing the same old two to three patients an hour. And I also worked um, PRN at a nursing facility just to make ends meet on, on the side as I was starting to plan pursuit physical therapy. I started killing it there. I was showing awesome outcomes. Physicians were uh, referring to me. I was working with physicians to do research. They were, you know, some of the other physicians that kind of poo-pooed physical therapy were happened to be patients of mine. So Things were going great. I was doing, I was killing it, doing awesome outcomes. And then two things happened that really opened my eyes where one, I was treating a patient here and then I was doing manual therapy. And then I had another patient beside me doing exercises on a treatment table. And I knew that I could have still helped this, this patient um, on the, on the table. And I looked up and my third patient is walking in and I'm like, this is insane. There has to be a better way. And then, so that kind of opened my eyes. I was like, man, this has to change. And then we were in a meeting and we were going over your clinical productivity or however you're built and stuff like that. And they were like, Ron, um, they were like, okay, so-and-so you're averaging five units of visit. You're averaging four units of visit. You're averaging four, 4.5. And like, Ron, you're averaging 2.5. You need to start charging four and five units of visit. And I was like, why do I want these people just hanging around? It's like, I'm trying to do what's best for the patient, but the system is different versus I'm trying to do what's best for the patient and get them in and get them out because I have to see two or three patients an hour. And then they're trying to make me see four and five units of visit for every patient. So there was just, I was like, man, there has to be a better way. So what I learned about this phase um, through the residency, one thing that I really learned was the concept of regional interdependence and how joints above and below the primary complaint do affect the um, primary complaint, say the how the hip and the lack of hip extension causes back pain sometimes or or vice versa, doing a thoracic manip 
affects uh, neck pain sometimes and like stuff like that. So I, that's the main thing I learned out of my orthopedic residency is the concept of regional interdependence. Um, another thing that I learned is the healthcare system is broken. There is a huge dysfunctional relationship between health insurance, the patient and the provider and the clinician. And there's a reason why that show Shark Tank doesn't want to deal with healthcare because it is a dysfunctional relationship beyond belief. I mean, whoever solves this problem is, should get the Nobel Prize or something because the business model of healthcare is reactive. It's not, it's not proactive. And you have these three entities that are going against each other. The patient doesn't know their health insurance or what their deductible is and how much it's going to cost. And then the patient pays the health insurance and then they think everything's going to be covered. And then the provider wants to do what's best, but then reimbursement is going down. So they got to overbill the health insurance company. And it's just a huge cluster you know what? Um, so the big point here is that there is a dysfunctional relationship in the healthcare system. And there's so many problems that it's going to be really interesting to see how things work out with this. Um, and from a business perspective, the next step is like, what's the goal with every patient? You know, if, if I'm in a hospital-based system and I have 10 beds, I want to fill all 10 of those beds. So I'm wanting more people to be sick and to stay there longer and to build more units for every visit and to see them three times a week for 12 weeks and then re-up again and do it again. It's like, it's the whole system is backwards. And there's a huge conflict of what is best for the business of healthcare versus doing what is best for the patient. So for me, again, I go back to that quote is like, don't I owe it to my patients to do what's best for them? And I owe it to them to do that. And so I still do what is best for the patient regardless. And that's why, again, you'll see why I went into my cash-based model. But, um, and this is a perfect example here. This is why we don't see lawyer cases anymore. This is a whole nother discussion that we could talk about. So this patient came to see us. This is my current setting. Um, they came to see us and she, it was a case of lower back pain. We probably could have got her better for four four thousand dollars she was halfway through her package her back pain wasn't fully gone yet but it was getting better we were getting her back to doing deadlifts we were, one of our goals was to get back to tennis and uh we wanted we were easing her back into that and then the lawyer was like no 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 wait wait wait, wait. what are you doing we don't want her playing tennis we don't want her doing this stuff and they actually pulled her out of pt okay so we she probably would have got better for a total cost of like four grand by the time that 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 we were done so two years later we get this notice from the lawyer of this is what happened to this lady she wasn't in that much pain and we were already getting her back to deadlifts and tennis and everything this poor lady got put into two spine surgeries a pain pain management anesthesia you could see pursuit physical therapy's bill was only two two thousand dollars at the time radiology and a neurosurgery so that poor lady went through so look at this bill. This is, I was blown away by this. And not just because of the cost, when we could have got her better for like $4,000, um, because the, the lawyer doesn't want her better for $4,000. So doing what's best for the patient isn't what the medical system and lawyers don't want that. They want to inflate that bill as much as possible because they get 33 and a third. No lawyer wants their patient better for $4,000. And then the second thing is that after all the procedures are all done, this email was requesting if I would be willing to take a thousand dollars for my two thousand three hundred dollar bill. They were asking everyone to take less to lower the expenses so they profit more. So it's a huge mess. And if you haven't seen this um, interview on the Joe Rogan podcast, this is a really great interview that exposes kind of the back end of big pharma and insurance relationships. I highly recommend you you watch this where this guy used to be a pharmaceutical rep and he kind of showed you how the system works regarding big pharma medications and insurance companies. It's really good uh, clip clip to watch. So is the healthcare business model built for what's best for the patient or what's best for business profits? Um, so I learned that standard PT and standard healthcare in general is really bad. And there's actually tiers in healthcare. 
like as we're new grads, we jump into it and just think that everything's at a high tier. It actually doesn't work that way. There's actually like average and standard clinics right in the middle. And then there's poor and scam clinics. There's actually scam clinics out there that are like, I don't even know what they're doing. Somehow they're getting patients in the door, but there's people that are really bad at healthcare. And then you got some that are doing okay. And then you got some that are doing great stuff. And then you have the best and the elite. There is a tier in healthcare. Not everyone's doing the same thing. There are tiers in healthcare and the quality and the outcomes with this. And that's something that I learned along the way. You know, is it really healthcare or is it more sick care? Not, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I learned that, you know, it's like there's more money in people being sick and staying sick longer and not getting people better faster, quicker in fewer sessions. So there's, I learned that there's a difference there. In standard care, I want that patient to come in as many times as possible, bill them as much as possible, see them as, you know, for more. And that brings in more money to the clinic versus what really healthcare is supposed to be. And we can go into a whole example of my wife and she was actually diagnosed with like MS, but um, to make a long, like a long story short, we consulted with three different neurologists. They all said she has, she has MS and they wanted to put her on MS medications, which costs like $50,000 a year, $35,000 a year. I refused to accept that she had MS. So we did a functional medicine approach and we kind of um, focused on solving the root cause. A couple of years later, turns out to make a long story short, her three lesions in her brain healed. She turns out she had breast implant illness, um, that her body was having an adverse reaction to the breast implants. She had two types of toxic mold and she has the worst allergies known to man. Uh, <laughs> we also did look at Lyme disease, but uh, we treated that for a year with, with no change. So we moved on to that. But the point is, if I never questioned anything, I would have been stuck with the diagnosis of MS and she would have been on MS meds for her life. And that would have generated so much more revenue versus over the next three to four to five years, we paid out of pocket and solved the root cause of this because insurance wasn't even going to cover any of the stuff for this. So there is a huge dysfunctional relationship in the healthcare system. And that could be a whole separate lecture anyway. Um, but um, with this, uh, it's like solving the root cause versus keeping her with MS and on medications forever. Um, this is where I kind of learned about functional medicine. This is Dr. Mark Hyman. He started the Functional Medicine Institute and the differences b between conventional medicine and functional medicine. And I lean more towards doing functional medicine. I love the concepts behind this and solving the root cause. So it's kind of like if a plant comes, it, if this is the plant, I can't just tie it up to some sticks and paint it green and say, hey, I solved the problem because everything looks good on the outside. Something's wrong with this plant in the roots. Something's wrong in the soil. Something's wrong in the plant that's causing it to look like this. I just can't like paint it green and make it stand up and make sure it looks good. So um, I use the analogy of stepping on a tack. If you step on a tack, you're going to have instant pain. I just can't shoot you with morphine and just say, hey, your pain's gone and or put a stim unit over top of the foot and say, hey, you can't feel the pain. So everything's fine. You know, you, you need to solve that root cause and take the tack out of out of your foot. It's not about treating the symptoms. It's about treating the root cause. So this is where I really learned the thing that changed my whole practice of solving the root cause and not just covering up symptoms or chasing pain. Um, so you have your diagnosis here. And before that, you have root cause or underlying impairments. And then from that diagnosis, you have pain and symptoms and then a change of function. So, you know, most people in standard care just focus on a diagnosis and treating the symptoms versus I really changed my whole practice of solving the root cause and those underlying impairments, which is causing the diagnosis. And then you'll get the real answers and the real results and get get back to doing what you want to do. So for example, for my wife, she had three, three lesions. And now on a recent MRI, those three lesions are gone now. So we actually were able to heal the brain over time by taking a functional medicine approach. So, you know, as you start treating patients, you know, are you treating the root cause or just the symptoms? 
Um, so let's get back to the story. We kind of went off a little bit. So now I finished the residency, I quit, and then I joined, I kind of worked part-time as I started my venture into opening a cash-based physical therapy practice, which is the new hope of actually practicing medicine the way I wanted. So I decided to quit that job and I ended up, uh, uh, started opening up my own practice. And then the whole time I was deciding, I've heard of this concept of cash base or and I've heard of this concept of doing standard insurance stuff. But if I would have done insurance stuff, I would have gone back to the same old, same old stuff because the insurance model is line up the beds, make sure all the beds are filled, bill more every 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 session, see them as many times as possible. So I was contemplating, do I go cash base or do I go insurance? So um, I started to plan out my cash base model. And then, you know, it's like you have doubt because I'm, I wasn't trained in business. Um, I didn't know what to do. So I pretty much was questioning, will a cash based practice work? Would patients really pay cash for treatments when they can go elsewhere and use, use, use their insurance? So it's like a whole different way of thinking about things. And how would how would patients even even find me if I opened up my own clinic? Can I make enough money at the time? I was I had a mortgage, I had student loan debt, um, so I was questioning whether I was going to be able to even afford it. So I decided to jump off into the ship and uh, pretty much decided to start my own cash based physical therapy practice. So I was a young Luke Skywalker at the time, looking off to the sunset where the two moons are setting. Um, and I started to open up my own cash-based physical therapy practice now. What I learned is that this was an interesting quote that at, at that time, I started looking around and trying to like read up on stuff. But when starting out, it's good to first look at what problem in the world are you solving? When you're starting a business, that quote kind of just stood out to me. So what problem am I solving by starting a cash-based physical therapy practice? So, you know, what problems are Uber, Amazon, Airbnb, Yeti, which I love that, that I can have a cold drink that lasts a long time. Scrub Daddies. What a simple problem, but what a huge company that this has created, just a sponge with a smiley face on it. You know, what problems are these companies solving? What problem do do I want to solve by starting a cash-based physical therapy practice? Okay, so that was one thing that I really wanted to focus on. And this was a great book that I read at the time was Blue Ocean Strategy. And it pretty much was, you know, it's how to take a business model and a market and kind of eliminate some things, reduce some things, raise some things and create new things to change, to kind of differentiate yourself and change um change the game pretty much um so you can go through this whole process and see you know not only what problem are we solving how am i going to do it better so you eliminate some things from pt raise some things reduce it and create it so we eliminated productivity standards double booking treatments that don't work patients getting passed around insurance limitations reduced waiting times we raised one-on-one -on -one patient care, communication, convenience of scheduling, even the standard care. We created a new cash-based model, a video-based home program, money-back guarantee. No one, no one else offers that. The pursuit patient experience and direct to consumer marketing. So we innovated and differentiated ourselves compared to the norm to really allow um, a new treatment model. Okay, so a cash-based physical therapy model provides a solution to many of our healthcare problems that um so through this model i was going to solve many of those problems from the patient's view and from the business view so in a business in a free market uh businesses succeed in a free market by providing a product or service that others want and meet the needs of of others so not only am i going to solve problems i have to identify the want and the needs of patients okay so what do they need patient need a decreased cost of care, easy access, successful outcomes, evidence-based and proven treatment approaches. Um, they want a great patient experience. They want to see the best. They want to get pain-free. So I made a list of all the needs and wants and made sure that I was able to deliver on these. So 
um, again, I'm creating a new system that appeals to the needs and wants of patients. Um, I also learned that there's a difference in mindset. Um, there's a difference from what successful people think versus unsuccessful. You know, you can almost say there's a difference in what rich people think versus poor people. There's a difference in mindset compared to people who are successful versus not. And I started reading a lot of these books. These are some of the most famous books. Um, and I wanted to get in that right mindset so I could uh, succeed also as I'm going into business. So now as we get back back to my story, now I'm going on my insurance rebellion. And the only reason why I put Rogue One in here was because of the Darth Vader scene in the hallway as he's going through all those <laughs> soldiers. So it was a it was an okay movie, but it's worth it just from the Darth Vader scene and and this movie. So I added it to this. So kind of opening up my own physical therapy practice called Pursuit Physical Therapy. I invested three thousand dollars of my own money to start. I rented one room in a fertility center building in Orlando, Florida. Yep. I was in a fertility center building starting a PT practice in it. I was going to do a new cash-based model based on outcomes and quality. I was going to be 100% cash and no insurance. So I started Pursuit Physical Therapy. This is what my first clinic looked like. It was just one room on uh, the second floor. Kept it. I had two cheap treatment tables. I kept my overhead low, two chairs, had some basic equipment. You know, I didn't do any modalities and it was a lot of manual therapy with, with a little bit of exercise. And, um, I, I had a great product and a great service. Um, but I had no marketing plan. I had no business plan. <laughs> I had no sales processes and I was doing free evaluations. Didn't know what pre-tax profit was. I was undercharging for my, my services. We all make these mistakes again in PT school. We're, we're not trained in any type of business and business strategy. So we opened up a business. I, I opened up a business and I had no clue and no strategy and no plan. Didn't even know what a PL statement was. And I was probably one of the guys that was getting wiped out by Darth Vader as I go into the world of business and free market enterprise. And uh, I was getting whooped by, uh, <laughs> by, by the market and by the, uh, um business master so i'm going against i'm going against vader right now on this one so what did i learn in this phase i learned about the e-myth the entrepreneurial myth and just because you're a good physical therapist doesn't mean you're going to be a good physical therapy business owner just because you're a good carpenter doesn't mean you, you are going to be a good um carpenter business owner there is a this is so true here this is a great book for anyone who wants to open up a business um, and kind of go into this, definitely read the e-myth and it's the entrepreneurial myth. Um, this is a huge problem that many people do. It. And this is also why 90% of businesses fail. It's because of these mistakes that this book highlights that just because you're a good PT doesn't mean that you're going to be good at running a PT business. And there's different phases that you have to go through between the adolescence phase versus um the infancy phase, adolescence phase, and like kind of adult phase of why you have to go through each phase and growth through there, or you're going to be stuck, burn out, and most businesses fail. So the next part of the story is may the force be with you because you need it when the empire strikes back. So now it's the struggles of running a business in the year one. I just opened my business. It's time to hustle and grind. I'm reading a lot of books. I'm trying to surround myself with like successful people, interviewing CEOs and business people. I was really blessed with some of the patients that kind of found me. Um, I was in that proof of, proof of concept phase. Um, I had a huge marketing and lead problem and I only had a few patients because I didn't have any systems or plans or strategies that, that I was doing. So I was a young Luke Skywalker at the time trying to be um, uh, getting mentored by Yoda. And I was trying to go against the uh, dark side of the force and the business world. So um, what I learned during uh, this phase is that your foundation needs to be strong, you know, whether it's um, uh, faith in Christ, but this is one of my favorite um, 
scripture references that I leaned on a lot when I first started out is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's not really about I, the thing that should be bolded is through Christ on this. So um, being a believer and praying a lot and getting through those hardships and having a good foundation of family too, and a good support system that, you know, sometimes you're, you're going to have to miss family dinner because you're going out and doing a guest lecture, you know, and, you know, it's, it's hard at first, but the point is, is that you have to have a good foundation to keep things going. And, um, cause when times get hard, it's, it's time to lace up the boots and go. So I learned the keys of, you know, the f- keys of failure and perseverance. This was a great quote from Denzel Washington. You're going to fall down seven times, but you're going to get up eight. So you will fall and you will fail at certain things and you will run into hardships. As long as you get up eight times, you're going to keep on going. So this was a great picture also that that I love that never quit because you may be one strike away from hitting diamonds, but you can never quit or you're never going to succeed. If you never quit, you you will succeed at some point. You'll keep on getting better. And uh Till you get that, but you don't want to ever quit when it comes to this. Again, I kept on, kept on reading. I'm reading all these books again sometimes. And I actually kind of went on, I started going on YouTube when I was driving to work. I'd listen to a YouTube video from any, any one of these guys just for motivation, perseverance, how to handle adversity, um, to have that right mindset to overcome obstacles, hardships and stuff like that. So even just, you know, you know, I always tell my daughter this, you can either be on YouTube and just getting dumber, or you can be on YouTube and actually using it to advance and get smarter and learn from it. So I was on YouTube a lot, just putting massive success videos in my brain going. Um, And I learned that, you know, most successful people have a morning routine. Okay, so I was like, okay, if I want to be successful, I got to start acting like successful people do. And I started to read some of these books where you learn that, wow, these people have, there's a difference between a high performer and the average person, you know, versus spending time consuming social media or actually reading books and learning and designing strategies. So I designed a morning routine. I get up at four, four thirty or five o'clock in the morning. I read scripture, I pray, I catch, and I do my uh, reading. By six o'clock, I'm in the gym working out for 45 minutes to an hour, leave at seven, come home, shower, change, get breakfast ready, get my daughter ready, and I'm out the door by eight. So I accomplish so much in the mornings by the time I get more done in the mornings than most people do throughout the whole day. So, and I learned that you have to have a plan and systems and processes in place and a strategy in place. Um, You need to have these things in place in order to be successful. And I designed this simple cash-based system here where marketing produces leads. The process of converting leads to an evaluation is just the phone call process. The process of converting evals to new patients is the eval sales process. And then you have revenue. So I created a simple cash-based system. I designed a marketing strategy that has been um, proven to work. And I designed my own marketing strategy to kind of have a system in place and a strategy in place of how I'm going to get get leads. This Simon Sinek TED Talk was great because I used to think that PTs are nice people and we just want to help, help everyone. And then I learned that the goal is not to do business with everyone who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe in what you believe and you'll attract these type of people. So if you target and address the why behind people's behavior and action, you're going to attract a certain type of person. If you haven't seen this TED talk, Simon Sinek's TED talk on why is great. I highly recommend that you watch this. And then, and then someone asked me this question once, are you pistachio or vanilla ice cream. And I was like, uh, I like vanilla better, but I didn't understand the concept. So vanilla ice cream appeals to the masses. It's a crowd pleaser. It's safe. It's easy, comfortable, um, but it's less fascinating. Pistachio is a distinct and polarizing choice. Those who love it really, really love it. 
And I actually know Sally. She's a like, friend of mine. And then I realized the goal of a session isn't to please everyone. It's to engage a few people really, really, really well. Um, and rather than dumbing down the taste to appeal to the majority, the producer can focus on serving a tightly um, defined core with a distinct point of difference. You want to be the most fascinating. You want to you want to highlight what makes you different. Instead of trying to outdo your competition, focus on what makes you different and how you diverge from standard expectations. So great book again, um, and really highlighting of how I was different and not, I don't have to treat every every single person. I can know who my perfect patient is. I can divine a, design a strategy and go after that ideal perfect patient, whether it's a niche market, a type of person, a mindset, whatever. I don't have to treat everyone. Um, and it's just as you go through the process, you'll learn the stuff because PT is coming out. You're always like, you just assume that everything's the same and you need to be able to treat everyone. So um, next part of the story is success. It works. A cash fee system actually works. And it's the return of the Jedi. So year two and three now, I'm a solopreneur still. You know, you're generating 10 to 15K in, in monthly sales at 100% cash. I'm generating leads and word of mouth referrals. Business numbers are healthy. I'm doing advanced training. I'm really helping people and I'm kind of mastering my craft. I'm doing manipulations, high quality physical therapy, needling starting and stuff like that. And it's actually working. So now I'm, it's like the return of the Jedi, the force is getting stronger and I'm ready to take on the Sith Lords and Darth, Darth Vader now. So what I learned during, uh, during this phase is evidence base is not the gold standard. It's actually years later. So, and just to summarize this research has to catch up to great clinical practice. Just because research hasn't been done yet doesn't mean it doesn't work. I'm not waiting 15 years for a high quality randomized control trial to come out to show me that doing a hip flexor stretch helps relieve patients who have extensive sensitive back pain. I don't need to wait 15 years for research to tell me that. So at some point, evidence-based practice does this, and then you start getting into clinical expertise and that's um, where research has to catch up to great clinical practice we kind of believe that treatment needs to be customized not standardized all the research is standardized and stuff and again there is a need for research we do need evidence that shows that it, it uh, does work but research one of the downfalls of it is tries to standardize standardize everything everyone with low back pain gets this same treatment approach and see what actually happens to it if you look at some of the research articles, a 50% outcome is actually considered a good outcome. In my clinic, that's a horrible outcome. No one's going to pay cash for a 50% resolution of pain. We're trying to get to like 75, 80, 85, 90% reduction of pain and get that as a reasonable good outcome. So the standards set higher and, and we believe that treatment needs to be customized. So now we're we're going from doing, okay, so we're, we're actually like a great clinic now. We're doing great stuff, showing great outcomes and really helping people. So now if I had to rank the tier of Jedi Knights and like Sith Lords, maybe we'd be a superior rating here. We're like right around A with like Blue Skywalker, Darth, Darth Vader. Should, oh, I see. He, they put Anakin up there. Anakin's and Darth Vader's the chosen one. So he should be up there as one. But um Snoke shouldn't even be up there. He got wiped out pretty quick. And I'm surprised they put Mace, Mace, Mace Windu up there. So that's interesting. So anyway, notice how they demoted Luke on this. I just recognized that. That's interesting. Young Luke Skywalker's an A, but older one's a B. <laughs> so anyway, we're at the level A now where our skill set is actually getting better. And patients are willing to pay cash for my services. So at Pursuit, we basically... I mean, Many people ask us, what type of patients do we see? So we see three types of patients, mainly people who value the quality of their health care and are willing to pay cash for it. Yes, these tend to be more richer, affluent people that really value the quality of, of their health of their health care. But we never judge a book by its cover. Um, you know, there's poor people and middle class people who still value the quality of of their healthcare and they're willing to pay cash for it. Um, 
We also see athletes who want to return to sport faster. Um, uh, they view it as it's it's valuable if I can get them pain free in faster sessions and to get them back to sport quicker and they're willing to pay cash for that. And then we see a lot of complex cases that failed other treatments. And this ends up turning out to be over 50% of our uh, caseload. Um, another clinical pearl of what I've learned along the way is that there's responders and non-responders to physical therapy. Some people with pain aren't going to respond to physical therapy treatments. And there's some people who do respond, okay? But there are there's a percentage of people that are not going to respond. You're not going to be able to fix everyone, okay? This is a perfect example. I unilateral back pain on one side. I'd get her to a zero every time. As soon as she laid down, she started to get back pain. And she had this growing on uh, the side of her spine. So there's some people that are not going to respond to physical therapy. And that's one of the reasons why we offer a money back guarantee that um, if you come here and in the first two to four sessions, if we if you're a non-responder, we believe it's not right for you to pay cash for PT services. So um, it's not guaranteeing that treatment works for everyone. It's if you're a non-responder, we'll give you your money back and we'll send you out on your way. So now I really started to understand value and what and what value means and what does the patient value. This was a great book that I read that actually put it in uh, to a simple formula that this is the patient value formula. Patient value, results and quality of the customer experience are on top. So if I want to increase patient value, if I increase results and increase the customer experience, it increases the value. The price and the additional cost are on the other end to a point. But if I want to increase value, if I show better outcomes and give a great patient experience, it increases the value of the patient. And when you're selling things, the value has to be in front of the price. It can't be vice versa, okay? You you can't present, oh, it's going to cost you four four thousand dollars to treat your pain, but this is what you're going to get. It needs to be flipped, where this is everything you get. You get this, 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 and this, and we're going to give you this, 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 and this, and you get all this for this amount. That has to be the value has to be in front of the price. Um, then I also learned, you know. When your product or service is the same as your competition, it's a race to the bottom. Um, perfect example, if you're comparing coolers here, it's like, okay, if your Yeti's $500 and your Arctic is $350, people are going to start buying the $350 one. If you're looking to put a fence in, it, in your uh, backyard, they get the same fence material probably from the same company or the distribution center. It's like, okay, who can do the fence the cheapest? I'm looking for a water delivery service. Is that, okay, it's the same water. It's it's just spring water. Who can actually deliver this the cheapest for me? Okay, this is the standard PT service example. Who's going to be able to do this the cheapest for me? And it's cheap in the big picture here, but it's like, what's the difference? What? How am I different? compared to these major brands and physical therapy. So I learned that if your product and service is the same as, as your competition, it's gonna be a race to the bottom. And then I learned this from Elon Musk that if you're starting a cash-based therapy business in an oversaturated healthcare market um, with lots of competition, your product and service needs to be far superior than your competition. Not a little bit better, not great, but far superior. So I can't be the same as some of these standard clinics and just hop in and opening up a cash base. Sense. I need to really focus on what the patient values and really set myself apart because my market, Orlando, is an oversaturated market. There's chiropractors everywhere. There's physicians everywhere. There's PTs everywhere. There's everything. So I'm in an oversaturated market. So I really focused on making my service so unique with massive value that there's nothing else to compare it to. So I created a irresistible offer um and i started creating more strategies now where i had a new phone call process i had a eval process i had my systems and processes in place i really focused on creating a new patient experience word of mouth strategy so i had some systems building up now and then this marketing thing st stood out to me a seth godden quote um selling to people who actually want to hear from you is more effective than interrupting strangers who don't so I really started 
to design more marketing strategies that, you know, attract to people that are actually want to listen to me, not just pop up in like someone's feed. But a new problem started to arise that if your business depends on you, you don't own a business, you have a job. And it's the worst job in the world because you're working for a lunatic. So this is straight out of the e-myth where I started to just be, it was just me. I'm working crazy hours. I'm doing everything. I'm wearing all the hats. And this started to be my number one problem. So as the story continues, the force not only awakens, but it helps pursuit grow. So I had to throw the scenes from the Mandalorian in here because that was, that saved the character of Luke Skywalker. And I was in like a fantasy world whenever that season two episode came out. That was unbelievable. And then the last series started with the Force Awakens and stuff. So now we actually started to expand and like grow. So I moved into a new building. I was running a real business now. I had my first employees. We were reaching 250 to 600K in like revenue, all cash. I started to design more systems and processes. We actually became the number one ranked clinic in uh, Orlando. And we're setting a new standard care in Orlando and, and really separating ourselves from standard care and other uh, local competitors. Um, really was what I call my uh, dream team. We were building our like dream team together. So I have some employees now. We're growing. We have experts. We're ranked number one. Um, we're squashing our competition and we're really putting out marketing out there that differentiates us compared to our competition or no waiting times. We have a concierge specialist who else has that. So we really highlighted on those things that makes us different. Um, and no one in healthcare has a money back, money back guarantee. So we started to increase in growth. Our sales started going up. Um, I actually had a real a real business. We completed our needling training. We have we have a great team, and now we're up there doing elite level care. That you know we're showing awesome outcomes. Now I finally get to move up here with uh, Yoda, Anakin Skywalker, and um, Darth Sidious, and now we're at that superior level ranking up here. So um, what I learned in this phase is that. I really don't understand how standard healthcare can be that bad, but it's so bad is that um, we see a lot of complex cases. And I use this analogy of like, if someone has back pain and you go to your primary care physician and they tell you that you have back pain, it's like, I didn't tell you anything. You already knew that walking in there. It's like, okay, what type of back pain do you have? And what's the best way to treat it? That standard healthcare is so bad that if you're decent in, if you're a great PT, you could kill it in a cash-based setting just because standard care is that bad. Um, auto cases of back pain where they're just laying down getting stim units for, and they're just abusing PIP and draining the $10,000 of PIP coverage in the first month and then pass you on the next thing. I mean, it's so bad. Um, and many cases of lower back pain that have failed multiple treatments again, again, we see a lot of these cases and some of them are complex, but some of them are just like easy cases that have missed, um, that people have missed the root cause of their back pain. So we're really doing really well with many of these complex cases. Um, if you look at standard care treatment options, you know, again, if you don't see this stuff coming, um, which I hope they start doing this because my outcomes are going to kill these things, these automated apps that are going to be treating back pain. This stuff's coming and we need to prepare for this. But um, I would put my outcomes and my team outcomes against any one of these things and it would blow it out of the water. But again, we need to kind of prepare for this because these these apps are coming and that if you don't solve the root cause and do proven treatment approaches, um, you can start getting these patients better faster and fewer sessions and really help out these complex cases. And you're going to start, we had a, we designed a testimonial process. So now our testimonials look, look like a novel, um, really showing excellent outcomes. Um, the testimonial process probably single-handedly is a game changer for me um, and really helping our clinic stand out. So now the force is strong in this and we even got better. We started like using the force, treating patients, we're like, 
and we started like lifting rocks and hovering from like room to room. Um, again, it, if you haven't seen the scene in the Mandalorian yet, you have to go to see the last episode in season two. That last episode was it saved the whole character of Luke, Luke Skywalker. So the force is getting strong in us and we're even getting better. Um, we created a new patient experience and added touch point integration. Um, one of the best books I read was Never Lose a Customer Again. And Disney actually has some some training also with the uh, consumer experience and stuff like that. We outlined a whole patient experience and we gave them an experience that blows our mind and, and exceeds expectations. We don't want to meet expectations. We want to exceed expectations. We created a new patient center system that focuses on everything that's best for the patient. So in a cash-based setting, again, you have to differentiate yourself from everyone else. And we're still holding true to that. We're doing what is best for that patient. And we believe that we owe it to you to do what's best for you. And you really want to show them that, that you truly care, especially for some of these complex cases. This is a quote from Lorma Mosley that no matter who walks in the door, um, that we want to show them that we right beside them and with them on their journey towards towards recovery. It could be an easy case, a complex case. It could be any person. We we want to show them that we truly care about them. We really focused, again, on getting results and excellent customer experience. Um, and now, this is where we are pretty much nowadays, growing a business, scaling for the future, and the rise of staff. So, yes, I know I skipped one. I skipped The Last Jedi. It was the worst one, and it didn't really fit into my story. There was a cool fight scene in there, um, but I didn't know how to add this in, so I did skip this one. So we're going right to the um, in the Rise of Skywalker. And my big problem with this whole thing is why didn't they have Anakin come back? That was the I was like, she can't be a Palpatine and be the one to overthrow me. Why didn't they have like a Force Ghost come back, Anakin? That would have been such a great ending on this. But again, it was a good movie. But it's called the Rise of Skywalker. Why didn't he? Why didn't Skywalker rise back up? Anyway, so now we're scaling and being a leader in an industry. Plus, I need to be a better leader now. So now we have we're forming our dream team of PTs. We're automating systems and processes. Um, I'm learning to be a better leader, and I need to lead the team forward, um, solving new business problems with scaling from to one one point five million trying to keep company values, principles, and visions aligned so everyone's bought into that and trying to scale to multiple multiple locations. We're changing the game. We did all these things in our Blue Ocean strategy that no one else does. Some of these are simple things, but standard care can't, can't do any of this stuff because the system's built totally different. So we're changing the game. And we're changing the game that standard healthcare is more like these starships that are trying to destroy the evil empire and do all this stuff. And our model is a bunch of Jedi Knights that are going to restore balance to the force. So no matter how or what standard healthcare is doing, I'm taking two lightsabers and going against Darth, Darth Sidious's lightning from his fingers. And we're able to stand up. And it's pretty cool that I'm not sure if this was a real scene from the movie or someone made this up, but you can see the Jedi Knights in the background. That's pretty good. So so we have our org chart now. We're running as a, we have department heads. We have, you know, our chief executive board. We have a real business and an org chart going now. We have a vivid vision, which is a three-year vivid vision that we just, this is the one that we just completed, trying to strive for 100% capacity and open up our second second location. This is our new vivid vision over the next three years of what we want to hit. Again, I'm trying to be a great leader and lead everyone to that. And these are some of the markets of what we're kind of going towards. Um, and I'm still learning. You know, I want to be a good leader. I don't want to be a boss that's telling people what to do. I want to lead by setting an example and being at. Let me change this for one second. Hold on. I hope it just didn't cut out on me. Okay, sorry about that. Let me go here real quick. 
Okay, so um, moving on to Medicine 3, 3.0 in the future of healthcare. Dr. Peter Tia is doing some really good stuff here. This is a great book to read if you like his stuff or want to look into what the future of medicine holds um, and what Medicine 3.0 is. Um, and I interviewed some people and one guy mentioned this, that if you new PTs don't stay productive and, and adapt, you're going to get crushed by health insurance companies. So is a cash-based model the way of the future? Um, I think it's going to be definitely a big a, a big part of it. You know, like what model provides the best value for patients? A private PT practice, the corporate mail, the tech, or a hybrid practice or a cash-based practice? I mean, I would definitely say the hybrid and the cash-based practice provides the most value for the patient. And we're defining value as showing the best outcomes and giving the base, best experience. So we have to look at where the future of physical therapy is going. Um, one of these really interesting quotes is um, from Wayne Gretzky. If you really want to be successful in business, you need to know where you're going. And there's power in the prediction of seeing trends in business. So one of the reporters was asking Wayne Gretzky, he's like, you weren't the fastest player, you weren't the biggest player, you weren't the strongest player, but you're still considered one of the greatest hockey players of all time. How come? And he, and he responded, most players skate to where the puck is, and I skate to where the puck is going. So are we physiotherapy and cash based physically skating to where the puck is or where the puck's going? So we have to look into the future. What are the changes coming to health insurance? How is health health insurance going to change in the future? What's going to happen to Medicare? You know, Medicare is going broke and the money going out is exceeding the money coming in. So there's going to be a problem there with that. You know, what's the future of the service industry with tech and like technology and losing jobs? I would say that the service industry is going to be okay still because many of the agriculture manufacturing jobs are going to get replaced with robots. And the service industry is still going to be okay. And you can see here that the service industry is still going to increase. Technology, is PT going to be replaced by an app? They're going to sure, as, as, as I'll try, and they're trying it already. Again, as I stated earlier, these companies are trying to replace us with an app. I don't think it's going to work, but um, we need to adapt to some of the trends with the performance-based economy. This is more so you're not going to be paid a fixed salary anymore. You're going to be paid based off based off of performance and and outcomes. And we need to adapt to that. You know, what's the public stereotype of physical therapy? We need to do a better job of educating the public and elevating our standard of care so the public recognizes physical therapy as, hey, I have back pain. I don't have to go to my chiropractor. I can go to my physical therapist. Um, and really focus on doing what's best What's best for the patient? Um, how do things like COVID COVID nineteen change change things? You know, we actually still grew in twenty twenty. We grew five percent in twenty twenty when like COVID happened. So we still grew. And then, what does the future hold for like AI? So these are some of the things that you have to ask yourself. And in the future, how is healthcare and us as physical therapists adapting to this? Because are we skating to where the puck is or, the, or where the puck is going? So this is the last thing. and This is the one thing that I wanted to kind of go over for any of the new grads or students that, that are watching this. This is the one big mistake that I wished I could go back and do. So <clears throat> wealth is created three ways. Again, I like to keep it simple, stupid. Wealth is created three ways, through real estate, stocks, and business, okay? So for any new grad, or DPT student out there watching this, my wealth tip to you is you all should be investing right now. And again, keep it simple. You know, the most successful people and the smartest people know the effects of compound interest and investing in uh, the stock market. And there's a great Warren Buffett video out there where he highlighted, um, he pretty much sat there and how about a, a piece of paper and was like, these are the top 10 biggest companies in the world right now. Five out of 10 of them are, are US companies and they're all part of the S&P 500. Let's go 30 years ago and see who the top 10 companies are. So he pulled up this sheet. These are the top 10 companies in the US 30 years ago. 
Six of them are U.S. companies, but none of these companies made it to this list. So the point of the whole lecture was stop wasting time and picking individual stocks and run with the S&P 500 over time and invest in U.S. US companies. So that changed the whole game of how I thought about things. You have to understand the concept of compound interest and over a time, how much money that you could be absolutely killing it if you start in your 20s, because time is of the essence for you. So look at this one on the right. Starting at age 18 and investing in a mutual fund or the S&P 500, that's a whole other argument here. Returns of 10% a year on 500 per month at age 62, that's 4.7 million. Okay, so you're probably, Ron, I'm in college, I don't have, or I'm a new grad, I don't have 500 a month to do. So here's here's another example. Assuming 15% growth, which is kind of hard, but possibly doable, and $50 a week investment. If you started in year one, whatever that is, by 30 years, you have 1.6 million at $50 a week at 15%. Okay, now again, 15 percents a lot too but even look at here if you look at your just say we we assume a 10 percent annual return if you invested 50 dollars a week 200 dollars here you you can see at 45 years that's 1.8 mil you can see the power of compound interest and in starting early here that you can't beat the s p 500 over the long term so all of you guys should be investing 20, 30, 40, $50 a week in an S&P 500. That's the one thing that I wish that someone would have taught me earlier because when I was 20, I didn't save any money and I spent it and I saved it and I spent it, saved it. And from 20 to 30, I had the same amount of money versus look at some of these S&P performances over the last 40 to 50 years that you could see that a lot of them are getting up, you know, most say that it averages 10% year year over year. But hey, look at last year. The S&P 500 itself was at 23%. QQQ was at 33%, which is tech heavy. If you divide the S&P 500 up, the top seven gained 72% and the rest of the stocks only gained six. So again, run with the S&P 500 over the long term. And if you're a new grad or a PT student, Try to get to that point where you're just investing, not saving, investing $50 a week in there um, and start creating real wealth and start investing in the S&P 500 and just set on automate and let it go. And all you guys should be millionaires by the time you're 30 years into it. So that's how you, a simple, easy way to become a billionaire. Investing in real estate and opening a business, that's a whole, a whole other game. But that would be my lesson to to teach some of you guys. So we went over my story, how I got started, some of the concepts and lessons, the future of healthcare and creating wealth. And overall, I believe the future of PT is bright. And the question is, do you believe in the future of physical therapy? Because the future is only as bright as your faith. So um, just let me know. Thanks for tuning in the whole time. Just let me know if you have any other questions. Thanks, thanks for watching this. I hope you learned something from it. And this is my cash-based story and how I got started.